hi from everyone and just give me like a two second what your business is just so I can get a sense of who's B2B, who's B2C, kind of what what's in the room. That would be super helpful. Sure. Uh, well, let me start. Um, my, my name is Roman. I'm a co-founder of Nutrient, and we do deep learning to bring uh, food as medicine to clinical practice. Uh, I would say we are B two B two C uh, company. Great. Thanks. I'll jump in. Alec Thompson. Um, we are a construction tech software B two B enterprise software. Awesome. Uh, I'll go. My name is uh, Elizabeth, and we are B2B building uh, payments infrastructure API uh, suite. Awesome. Uh, I'll jump in. My name is Joe Saavedra. Uh, Infinite Objects is the company I founded. We're a hardware company, uh, primarily B2C, but we have a lot of B2B dreams, and we've already executed on a lot of that. Great. Uh, yeah, I'll go. Um, I'm Zachary. I'm the uh, founder of Grow Squares. Um, we're a, a smart urban gardening company. Um, we're a, a DTC company, um, but just like uh, Joe, we have some uh, kind of B2B contracts as well. Awesome. I'm Daniel. Uh, I run We Are The New Farmers. We're a controlled environment agriculture company, mostly B2C, and we grow um, algae, edible algae. Cool. My name is Reggie. I'm the founder of a, of a company called Seasons. We're building a rental service for menswear, streetwear, um, primarily B2C, but also B2B as well. Great. Hello, Calvin Smith, a remote recruitment platform, B2B. Great. Hi, this is Lola. Um, we have a direct to consumer health tracking app. Uh, health tracking app via blood testing and saliva testing at home we are d2c i think there's only one or two more left i think they might be having trouble with video so all right so i'll, I'll just jump in i'm going to just give a quick um pr kind of spiel but i really do think it's way more advanced um beneficial for you guys to answer questions because I know um, PR is likely one of the biggest questions many founders have. I've seen it time and time again. Um, so as you may know, I'm the partner at Jennifer Beck Communications. We're a media relations firm specializing in fast growing startups. Um, we work across a lot of different markets from fashion, retail, and e-commerce, um, food and bev, home and lifestyle, social impact, social innovation. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a few other categories. Um, and we work with brands at all stages. So pre-launch, um, all the way up to brands that are um, valued at a billion dollars and close to IP IPOing and everything in between. So we've seen every life cycle, every stage of life and every size of business. Um, all of our brands are founder led. So we do put a big emphasis on thought leadership and building brands um, from an earned media perspective and how do you create thought leaders around the brand itself and the founder while also speaking to that person's end user or whoever the stakeholders are, the consumers. Um, so that's, that's a basic, that's our approach, um, kind of super, super high level. I know this talk in particular is focused on how do you prepare for, um, a potential comms partner? How do you set yourself up for success if you are bringing comms into the fold? Um, a lot of brands come to us not even having thought about it or not having um, anyone in house or having, having experienced PR in at all. So I think what's really important for founders as you are preparing your businesses, is everyone here pre-Series A or at the C stage? Is, is that, that's right, okay. Um, how do you make sure that you're set up for success? We get brands that are at seed rounds and, and in their infancy, um, but we also get brands who are already past their seed rounds going into series A. Um, and what's really important is understanding, um, are, are you guys all pre-launch or are you guys in market? Like who's in market and who's pre-launch? Pre-launch? Okay. And the rest of you are in market. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 
So um, I think the, the number one thing that is the most important thing to know as you're going into the comms world and understanding how to make sure PR actually work for you and, and actually drive growth and scale. So I think that's the biggest thing is people, people don't think the investment in PR actually will t have any kind of return, but it really truly does um, in a lot of different ways. One, it drives traffic interest it um, ultimately converts into sales in whatever form that means for you as a business it attracts investors um, i think in the seven years we've been around we have ge definitely generated hundreds of millions of dollars in venture capital for our brand from press um, so the investment is um, one to make if you have the right partner who understands your company and understands media and understands what actually is going to move the needle and what is the objective of why you're doing a particular story, why you're doing a particular conference, and what are you gonna get out of it? But before you can do all of that, you have to understand what is your differentiator and how do you can change, how do you create messaging around your brand and who you are that is going to make sure that it lets, allows you to shine against your competition. Because for the most part, you all are competing either with incumbents in the space who already own a lot of the market, or you're competing with other startups who are maybe doing something similar, kind of similar, adjacent to you, whatever it is. Um, it is rare that someone is the only one doing something. So the first thing you have to make sure that you have really um, understood about yourselves is what are the key differentiators and how do you want to talk about it? And how does that compare to how the competition is talking about it? Um, is it only a slight variation? Is it strong enough or is it differentiated enough? That's something we do with every brand we work with. It doesn't matter how long they have been around. So obviously with our pre-launch brands, we spend a lot more time on messaging and positioning and understanding the landscape, the competition, and what their opportunity is. And what is the, the messaging opportunity that we know is gonna work? Um, we do the same thing with brands that come to us three years into launch uh, or into market, four years, five years. It doesn't matter. You really have to make sure you understand what is the one thing I need to get across about who we are that's going to be consistent every time I speak about the brand, every time someone writes the brand, uh, writes um, a story about the brand. So I always say messaging is key. It seems so simple and so straightforward um, and kind of like PR 101, but it's um, shocking how often we meet with founders who um, still have a hard time explaining who they are and what they do and how they're different and special and unique um, within their own market, within the competition. So that's obviously step one. Um, I would assume a lot of you have done a lot of that brand work, hopefully, and can go to the table when you do meet with comms folks, um, talking about how you can differentiate and then take their advice, obviously, because they're gonna look at it from a different lens. Um, obviously, the next step is understanding the media landscape. This is something I noticed um, that you guys have so much to think about between um, marketing and staffing and all of it, you know, how do you, deal with your investors that sometimes you're not understanding thing or having the time to understand things like the media landscape and, and what works and what doesn't and what fits and what doesn't. So get, having a good understanding of media and kind of what people are writing about now, what the temperature is in the space that you're in, is there an appetite for it? Just spending a little bit of time educating yourself on the media front is really important. Um, and also understanding where do you actually want to be and make sure that lines up with whoever you're going to be working with, whether it's an internal comms person or an external comms person. Um, I want to stop there just because I want to see first if there are any questions on anything I've already spoken to you about, or we can spend the next 20 something minutes just on Q&A because I think a lot of what the question a lot of the PR conversation really is about answering questions that people don't get access to folks that need it to be transparent and that's um, I'm totally happy to be as transparent as possible um, I can speak to I, I've been doing PR for 12 14 15 years at this point so I've seen a lot I've done a lot I've worked in-house I understand kind of being on both sides so I'm happy to help you guys get a better understanding of how do you kind of navigate the comms world for your own businesses. So does anyone have anything that they want to jump into now? Or, I mean, I'm like I said, just jump right in. Yeah, uh, I've got a question. I mean, in general around, you know, PR and messaging, what have you seen, you know, obviously the last month has been a, a super huge shift in, in most things. What are there any examples of some some kind of uh, campaigns that you've seen go on that you feel like were super successful 
because I, I mean, there's definitely been some kind of distasteful campaigns um, that have gotten bad press when they when they kind of approached the situation and, and messaged incorrectly at this moment. Um, I would love to just hear any examples that you have of successful um, stories in the last month. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I think the there have been a few. One is the, I think it's Talkspace and the state of New York, is it Talkspace or Headspace? One of them, the mental health um, app offering free um, mental health support to New Yorkers right now um, in coordination with the state of New York, I think was a really brilliant move on their part. They have the bandwidth to do it, the, you know, the reach, um, and obviously can financially afford to do something like that. So I think um, any campaign where you can really make a, a major um, contribution to what's going on, um, is super impactful and then ultimately will get you so much press. So I really loved that announcement. Um, there was a mental health company, a lot is going on in mental health, but that's why it's, it's just top of mind because we follow that space. Um, but mental health companies that or businesses that have been traditionally um, only brick and mortar, obviously, which are not encouraging anyone to go physically anywhere, anyone who shifted really quickly to offer telemedicine or telehealth services, whether it's for free or discounted price um, and has been nimble enough to make that happen, I think has been a really smart play and smart move. So those kinds of pivots. Um, and from what I understand from these startups, because um, I know them directly, that they're realizing how important having a virtual experience is, that they're actually building it into their business model ongoing and had originally thought they were only going to be face to face. So I think, you know, brands that are taking advantage of the crisis in the sense of I'm learning where our holes were, and I'm learning that there were elements of our business that we hadn't even tapped into given this crisis that are now making us stronger. Um, you know, we have a client who is um, a completely brick and mortar wellness service um, and with a small e-commerce business, and they're shifting a lot of what they do into virtual content, providing a lot of um, added value to their clients and their customers. Um, building up their e-commerce offering and realizing that if they did do this right in the next couple of weeks to months, that they can make e-commerce a much larger part of their um, revenue share where retail was, I think it was like 90, 10. I think they're projecting that they can make it 75, 25, which I think makes you a much bigger, stronger, less vulnerable business. Um, there have been a lot of brands that are doing you know, if you sell, if you know, you can buy a pack of five masks and they donate the exact same amount um, to, you know, frontline workers. I think that's a really smart play if you can be nimble enough to create those masks quickly and um, get them out into the market. There have been a handful of brands that are doing that. There are some brands that I've seen, obviously we've seen a lot of things that don't work, but anything that is encouraged people to buy without kind of an equal or greater give is um is has, has been seen as negative so you know i think a lot of brands have had to be really careful about what are they promising and what are they giving and we've actually recommended to a lot of brands to do nothing if they can't do what feels right and and it's better to do nothing than than something that's kind of halfway so um hopefully that answers that question good i had a question more around your engagement model with your clients um, because at the startup level, I would imagine positioning being like a, it's not a one-time thing, right? You, you most likely are a partner that evolves with the company. Um, how does that translate to your contract? How does that work? Is it like a retainer model where people come in and say like, let's add on hours or like, can you talk a little bit about how you start from the days of our ship? Yeah, yeah. I think, um, we take exactly what you said about it being an ongoing partnership is how we look at the brands we bring on and, and, and work with. Um, we are looking at brands on our roster similarly to VCs in the sense that we're bringing them into the portfolio because we see a potential exit and we see ourselves being with them for that time. So definitely anyone we're working with is on an ongoing retainer. Um, and the positioning work is done during the onboarding process at the beginning. Once that's done, that's when you build out your comm strategy and that's when you start executing and start getting those great stories. Your positioning and messaging should be revisited every three months, every six months, anytime that you, or anytime the founder has just said, 
like a moment like this where they're realizing they're evolving their business model. We need to rethink the messaging positioning. We need to revisit it. So it's not set in stone. It's, it's something that you start off with and you evolve it over time as the brand um, matures. So you really should look at your comms partner as that kind of a partner. Um, the problem, and this is just our philosophy, but the problem with projects, if you have people coming in and out, in and out, in and out, they're never fully ingrained into the DNA of your business um, or invested, not just financially and with their bandwidth, but also like on an emotional level to be honest, you know, they, you want them to be just as invested in you and your success as anyone else you've hired internally. Um, so it really depends on, on what kind of relationship you're looking for with an outside partner. Um, but for us in particular, that's, that's our approach. Any other questions? Just remember, you might be on mute if you're talking. Well, I actually had another question, which is um, just any sort of high level tips or frameworks around how you deal with B2B versus B2C, whether it's like sort of characteristics of a successful comm strategy between those two types of companies. I'm B2B, but I just don't hear as much about that. So I'm just wondering like what you're thinking. Yeah. I mean, you're just, you just have to think about your targets differently. So if you're B2B business, so for example, we worked with an HR, I think someone here said they're in recruiting or right. Am I remembering? Anyway, and we worked with an HR um, focused, client for a time who had was b2b and b2c but her bigger business was b2b was getting enterprise clients right so what she didn't need was more resumes she had plenty of those so the consumer press and reaching her demographic wasn't that difficult what she needed to do is attract the chief people officers and, and whatnot of her business and so you just have to think differently about okay if those are the targets where are they consuming media they're still consuming Fortune, Inc., Fast Company, Entrepreneur. They're still reading all of that. But there's also a whole world of trade media that they're consuming and following on a regular basis. So that had to be a part of our mix and make sure that the media that we were reaching and targeting were where they were consuming. So that's, a, that's actually literally the same for a B2C company. You're thinking the exact same way. Um, you just change your mix of media. And obviously, when you're thinking from a thought leadership perspective, that founder, we spent way more time on HR specific conferences and speaking engagements and op eds and thought leadership in that way um, than, you know, more consumer focused conferences or solely focused on startups and things like that, because that's not where her chief people officers were. So I think, and literally, for that approach is the same um, for consumer brands as it is for B2B brands. You just have to curate and think about who are the stakeholders? How do I reach them? Where are they? And, and how am I gonna be the most impactful when I do reach them? Um, so the, the approach should be the same, um, but the, the target should be different. Yeah, I have a question. Um, because our product has gotten a lot of visibility, um, simply because people are staying at home, um, we have a physical garden that takes, uh, takes a couple of months to, to grow successfully. Um, we found a lot of content publishers and magazines wanting to feature um, the, the, the system, but um, they oftentimes want to you know, play with it themselves to make sure they're not you know, putting yeah. their badge of honor on something that doesn't work. Sure. Um, you know, it, takes, it takes two months to grow, so by the time that you know, kind of finalizes, um, it's got a long lead time. So I'm wondering if there's proxies for sending them something they can manipulate it, whether or not it's an expert or really just sort of proof that um, this thing will work without actually having you know, them to, to take two months to, to, to mess with the product itself? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And, and we've experienced that in the past as well. Um, yeah, so I think what we've done is a lot, is we've, we've used case studies or consumer reviews, um, or we've created the videos and assets. As, and I would assume you have all of those. Um, hopefully, and if you don't, I would definitely invest in those because the more visual assets you can show them, customer reviews, talking about the process that they could inject into their stories. Because um, to your point, what they're trying to make sure is that whatever you're saying you're doing or you're, will be the end result actually happens. If you can answer all of those questions for them in advance by providing the framework, 
Um, you can still gift them, but that means that they'll be more apt to write about it before that time if they already are like, I've, you've structured it so in a way that I can write it now, knowing that um, mine in particular hasn't reached that, that kind of apex, but given all the reviews I've seen, your social, the videos you've created, the expert opinions, all of that, I can write a story now. That, that's half of it. The other half of it is um, the relationship, the, whoever's pitching that editor has. Because when you have a strong relationship, you can say, I'll send you one, but I don't, I can't wait two months for you to write a story. Um, it's as simple as that. But, and, but so that's the other half of it is um, whoever is doing, brokering that, you know, story on your behalf. Do they have the relationship with that person to be able to have them prioritize a story? Um, because we don't always have time to wait for review stories either. Hopefully that's helpful. Very. Good. Um, anyone else? Does anyone actually have PR right now, like an outside person or internal? I'm just curious. Or have done any press? You kind of doing it on your own? Yeah, we've had several <laughs> partners, uh, kind of project based. When we did a release in the fall, and we did another release in for Valentine's Day. We, yeah. We had individual because we're a small company, so we don't have a massive budget. At one time, we did have a contract PR for about six months. Um, and, uh, and it was great, it was very fruitful, but it was expensive. And, you know, we were in a place where uh, that actually didn't justify the cost at that moment. And so, uh, you know, going forward, we probably will bring on a long-term partner, like you're saying, there's a lot of value in that. Um, but for us, you know, we got our foot in the door with a lot of different outlets in terms of like editors right. and, and um, blogs and et cetera. And so we've been able to leverage that ourselves um, recently. Um, but good. Yeah. That's good. Has anyone had to make adjustments to their business because of COVID? That uh, for the, those brands that are in market, I'm just curious, like, what have you done? And ha have you seen any press around it? Even if you're just leveraging your own relationship? We, we dropped all of our B2B efforts, mostly because those timelines ended up like kind of exploding. They were, you know, we almost closed a deal with NBC and another deal with the NBA. And both of them were like, you know, right when everything dropped last month, they were like, okay, this is on pause now. Right. So we've like completely, you know, shifted away and focused entirely on the direct to consumer, um, which is fine actually. And it's, it's proving to be a, the better, direction for us. I know. Yeah. Remind me what category you're in. Consumer.